This is Interpreting Wine host and founder Lawrence Francis welcoming you to this, my Willamette Valley winemaker special. Across these 20 episodes recorded in quickfire fashion in January 2020, I got to meet a broad selection of people making wine in the region, both a variety of winemaking scale from the micro to the macro, and also different focuses that include different aging vessels, different grape varieties, sparkling wines, and of course, different interpretations of Pinot. Episodes are going to be released in the order that they were recorded, so you'll get to be a virtual guest on the tour. Two things you can do to help spread this series even further. One is to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already, either where you're listening or on your favorite podcast platform. And the second, the one that's really going to help push this out there, is to head to interpretingwine.com slash iTunes and leave a review letting me know what you think. A genuine huge, huge thank you in advance. Today's episode of the Willamette Valley Winemaker Special features John Groschow of Groschow Cellars. In what is the 20th and final episode of this very special series, John tells us his origin story and transition into the world of winemaking. Before taking us on a deep dive into the origin of the fruit he uses for his wines and giving us an overview of his range of wines, before sharing with us his future vision. Enjoy. But my beginning was really in restaurant uh, in in Oregon, uh, Willamette Valley, or right here in Portland. Uh, I grew up here, um, but I also had the uh, good fortune of living in France when I was younger. Uh, I was racing bicycles, uh, living in the Loire Valley, uh, as well as a Paris suburb. But those weren't so much informative of wine, wanting to follow wine as a path, more of just seeing wine as part of life, seeing it as part of every celebration, every meal. When there was a team victory, uh, there was wine or champagne. And uh, But because I was trying to become a professional athlete, I wasn't drinking a whole lot of wine. We were drinking it here and there. Um, but uh, it, it was uh, formative in, in a, a cultural way. Uh, but when I realized that my goal of being a professional cyclist was not going to happen, I came back to Portland and I started working in restaurants uh, or started back working in restaurants. And uh, originally I thought the, the idea was maybe to go in to learn to be a chef. So I've always loved cooking. I, I had the good fortune of having a mother who who was an excellent cook, and I spent a lot of time in the kitchen with her. Um, so uh, I started working on the service side of a restaurant and, and kind of eyeballing the, the, the kitchen and very quickly gave up on that concept because the culture and lifestyle did not suit who I was. Uh, so uh, because I lived in Portland and worked in a fine dining restaurant that uh, where a lot of winemakers dined, I started pestering people with questions and um, about, about the vineyard and winery. And we, what happens when you ask a, a winemaker a lot of questions is you, you get offered the chance to work for free. Um, volunteer <laughs> come help us bottle come help us prune come help us do this and that so I started doing that um, and uh, really loved the work uh, so I hatched a plan to move to California work harvest and then maybe work in restaurant in San Francisco and then head to UC Davis that was the uh, the goal um, but uh, that plan was very quickly thwarted by a relationship um, that, uh, that had reignited right before I left for California. And so after nine months in California, worked a harvest, was tending bar in a nice restaurant in San Francisco, I chose to move back to Portland. But the goal, the goal was still there. Yeah. Um, so I came back and I immediately started working harvest and such in uh, uh, Willamette Valley, first at Erath Vineyards, uh, which is which was great, uh, but also uh, because it was it was a large winery where I w learned a l how to do a lot in very little space. Um, 
it wasn't highly detailed winemaking. It wasn't anything about the vineyard. It was making grapes into wine. Yeah. Um, but from there, I realized what I needed to do is work for a small winery. And I had the good fortune of landing uh, a, a job with uh, Doug Tunnell at Brickhouse Vineyards. So, um, and that was uh, incredibly formative because it was working in the vineyard and the winery and learning really what it was all about. Because up until that point, I'd only seen grapes, uh, you know, sorted, fermented aged and, and turned and bottled I, I hadn't seen the vineyard and underst- had no understanding understanding of it before that point and that's where I learned the most uh, so yeah after four years there I, I started my own business and now I'm here so we started in 2002 uh, honestly it was maybe a bit on the early side I I didn't have an, an accurate idea of what exactly I wanted to to create all i want to do is make really good pinot noir and beyond that style i I didn't have a full concept but uh we we had a a successful harvest 2002 uh we made 300 cases of wine of all wine valley pinot noir blend of four different vineyards and um we we made the choice of um of uh, blending it all together into one wine. We didn't want to come out of the gate having a bunch of different wines and, and it, and it, it, it it worked out nicely. Um, you know, for me, um, the goal has always been to make wines that are more food oriented. I I like the food with wine concept. Um, I, I worked in restaurant and it's always trying to be that, uh, food oriented wine, but I didn't really understand exactly how, where I wanted to go when I started. Um, now we're making over 10,000 cases of wine and, um, uh, it, it, we got here not, it wasn't the original, even it wasn't an, uh, even after five years, it wasn't my goal. It just kind of happened that way. But uh, over time, you know, we've, uh, we, I'd say the first five years uh, was kind of learning what I wanted. And then the next few years was learning how to m- get what I wanted. And, and really the last five years is being, or well, last eight years is like, okay, now we're, we're just keep going. Um, but um, I'd also say that um, because I, I started with, um, uh, the, within the restaurant industry, uh, I didn't come into this business uh, with deep pockets. So value has always been a very important thing for me. I always wanted to create wines that 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 punch above their weight, that give you more than you were going to expect for that price point. Um, and trying to make wines of value that just are not manufactured. Uh, I think uh, so many of those wines that that show um, or that have that hit that fifteen to twenty dollar price point are just made in a large farm, and it's they're kind of they're kind of dumb and and they're well they're products they're products uh, not unlike a Coca Cola they're they're always the same they always hit the same marks they don't show vintage they don't show where they're from they just show they're a wine based product um, so we're trying to bring uh, a little bit more. Uh, of the earth and, and vintage into uh, value places. And that's partially why we had to grow so much is because we're very value-oriented. just took me a while to figure out the business side. <laughs> Genuinely, I do always respond very well when I hear... Uh, you know the, the those kind of two things being put together the wanting to make obviously the best wine that you can but then also bearing in mind value and, and i've you know i've already said it on this trip and I've, I've said it a number of times on the podcast that i genuinely feel those are for me the most important wines full stop they, they really are because they they just give anybody who you know has I guess a desire maybe that they never knew they had to to kind of trade up and give something you know diff, slightly different you know maybe slightly nicer label than they used to or um, yes yeah, sl- slight, slightly nicer um, wine that, that they might be used to it just gives them a, 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 an excuse and, and I guess lets them feel okay about doing that you know without sort of blowing 
you know, you can spend sixty dollars, you can spend eighty dollars, you can spend a hundred dollars, and you'll get nice juice, won't you? But you know, to 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 bring it within the reach of people, I think is yeah, it's a really admirable thing, and it's something I yeah, I say respond very well to. Um, that being said, I think it would be yeah, great to sort of yeah hear you you kind of riff, I guess, on the the fruit really that's that's going into those wines. You know, it's it's not an insignificant amount of uh, wine that you're producing for, for those exact reasons that you mentioned um, so yeah where's it coming from maybe as I've been doing with most people on, on the tour is just sort of yeah giving them the opportunity to talk to the terroir you know whatever that word means be it geography be it soil you know what's going on in the in some of the areas again it can be at a fairly high level in the areas where this fruit is being sourced from okay well, for for the uh, the large blend, the the commuter cuvee, as we call it. Um, actually, let me grab. I have a bottle with me. Um, it's got a bike on it on the label, which speaks, of course, to my past uh, bike racing and bike riding, as I still do. Uh, but also, it's 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 very Portland. <laughs> but um, uh, this wine is is a blend of. Gosh, I think probably eleven or twelve different vineyards this year, two thousand eighteen vintage. Uh, we bottled just under eight thousand cases of that wine, um, so we're hitting. Oh um, well, we're hitting a lot of sub AVAs of the Willamette Valley, so it is very much a Willamette Valley melange. Um, because of this price point, which it retails for around. Twenty dollars U.S. Uh, some places a little less, some places a slightly more. You know, it's it's a, an interesting web of uh, distribution. Um, we are not working with some of the A sites, the sites uh, there uh, in Dundee Hills, uh, Ribbon Ridge, and so forth. These uh, uh, we have some sites that are l- fairly low elevation. Um, but we also have some very old, well, one of which is only for this uh, bottling. Um, it is over 30-year-old vineyard, but it's not in a great area. And when the vines get to that age, they really um, uh, they start limiting themselves quite a bit, too. Um, they're, they're not uh, as precocious and, and reactive. Uh, uh, they're... they're don't have nearly as much vigor issues as a younger vineyard and the, the thicker soiled areas. Um, but uh, that is that is a vineyard that's only in the Willamette Valley. It's called Cochrane. Nobody's ever heard of it. I don't even remember how I got in touch with these people, but I've been working with them since 2011, I believe. Um, but um, there, I been able to buy uh, excess grapes from higher end vineyards too because uh, in years like 14 2014, 2015 2017 and to a lesser extent 18 we've had large yields uh, in our vineyards and we've been able to uh, buy some grapes at the end of harvest that after they've met their contracts uh, I just know enough people uh, after been being in the business for 18 years, where they they'll come to me uh, first, and and they they know it's uh, will be in good hands. So um, we're able to hit some nicer vineyards in the Old Amity Hills and Shehala Mountain sub AVAs as well. So, but you know, there's no specific terroir other than Willamette Valley. It is both uh, it is both volcanic soils as well as sedimentary soils as well as uh some very thicker flood flood soils and you can hire vigor vineyards you can make good wine out of without adding a bunch of junk to the wines i mean there's so many products you can add and a lot of people approach high yield uh low elevation sites by uh adding a lot of oak adjunct, adding a lot of enzyme, adding a lot of polysaccharide, and so forth. All these things you can add to it, but um, but if you keep your yields proper and you expose the fruit properly, you can really get not top quality grapes, but very good quality grapes without uh, selling your soul to the devil uh, in the wine store, wine wine supply store, winery supply. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
But um, we, the style of wine we make with that, you know, we, we definitely are trying to pick things on the earlier side uh, to get that kind of crunchier style of fruit, not, not a big sweet supple style of fruit but more I like to use the the analogy of like the, uh, the nectarine you have on your counter in the summertime and you you, you pick it up and you, you think no tomorrow tomorrow it's going to be right that's the fruit we want we want the fruit that's not ready today uh, we want that yeah that very crunchy and um, uh, energetic style to the wines um, oh wait those french fries <laughs> Sorry, um, and the uh, um, the uh, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought because of the first phrase. <laughs> right, I'll, I'll, edit. No, I'll, I'll, I'll edit. Yeah, I this is one. Yeah. But um, so yeah, we want that crunchy style. We we ferment uh, at fairly cool temperatures, and we we really try to limit the extract. We don't want to like pound the wine uh, uh, too much because we're also not going to age it very long and we don't use any new oak. So we only age it nine and a half months. Um, we use n no new oak, but 70% of the wine is in barrel uh, and it's all French oak, but the barrels are between three and eight years old. Um, we also... Um, uh, age now, well, sorry, 30% was in stainless, but this year we brought in some concrete into the mix because we're trying to bring in larger uh, vessels for aging of the wine. That actually brings something to the wine. I mean, stainless steel is innocuous. It's the by, that's what it's for. It's trying to be very direct and pure, and we like that part of the wine. But uh, concrete uh, has been used for ever in Europe, and uh, it brings a nice texture uh, and almost a salty presence to the wine that you just don't get in the U.S. because we have such acidic soils. We don't have those base uh, uh, lime soils you get in Europe. We have these acidic soils, and you just it's hard to find that texture in the wine, and the concrete tank brings a little bit to the wine, and I'm really excited about uh, for 2019, having that being a portion of our commuter cuvee. And, and the goal is to hopefully bring more and more of the concrete vessels into that wine to bring this, uh, bring that texture that we want in balance with the stainless steel and the, the older oak. Yeah, so the commuter cuvee is 85% of our production, uh, approximately. Uh, with the other 15%, we're making Melon de Bourgogne, uh, we're making Pinot Blanc, we're making Chardonnay, and, of course, Pinot Noirs. Uh, you know, Milan, it gets such a bad rap uh, from Muscadet, although it's increasingly getting better and better rap, which is wonderful. But it's, it's something that I've always loved, that, that great fresh oyster wine, mineral uh, and bright acids, a little limey. And we've been making it since 2012, but we've been refining what we've been doing every year. And I finally think I've hit the right, um, uh, for lack of a better term, recipe as far as the vessels I use for fermentation. Um, we're using concrete eggs uh, and uh, uh, acacia wood barrels uh, in this wine, as well as some neutral French oak. Um, the concrete brings volume and the aforementioned saltiness from the concrete. Uh, it brings a, 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 a round, rich, lazy texture to the wine, but it's a little bit of a, a you know, kind of calcareous saltiness. Uh, whereas the acacia brings this kind of a floral green uh green in in sorry it's always a hard word to use with wine even though it, it's very appropriate sometimes not none that negative kind of uh um uh green bean or, or green pepper but um more like a like if you snapped a fresh tree branch off you know it has this raw green wood aspect to it um, but it also brings more buoyancy to the palate and just, again, more volume. I mean, this wine, which you're tasting right now, is it's 11.8% alcohol, but it feels like so much more richness, despite the pH also being super low. Um, uh, I think it's about 3.2, I want to say. So there's a, a fair amount of acidity in that wine, but the vessels we use and the, the with the lees stirring in the vessel... 
uh, well, at least with a concrete tank, it just kind of constantly keeps the leaves in suspension. Um, it, it feels like a weightier wine than it is. Um, I spend way too much time on a wine that retails for eighteen dollars, but I love <laughs> love the wine. <laughs> but um, but with, with the Pinot Noirs uh, that we make that are upper end, um, they're made quite differently from the commuter cuvee. Uh, they're, the vineyard site, sites are obviously. Uh, uh, higher elevation, thinner soil, more struggle, you know, farmed for more intensity um, rather than volume. Uh, we, we pick a little bit riper, a little bit later. We ferment usually with a fair amount of whole clusters in those wines, uh, vintage dependent. Warmer vintages get more, uh, cooler less. Uh, but uh, that's mainly because those warm vintages, of which we get more and more of, um, tend to be, the wines tend to be very fruit focused. And wines that are about fruit or all about fruit are just so boring to me. I like savory. I like texture. I like wines that have some cut and um, feel rather than just you just keep talking about the fruit notes. Great. You know, fruit and oak notes are boring um, to me. Um, uh, I mean, it's a, a huge part of it, but it's just when it's all about that, it's just not what I'm after. So the, the whole clusters are uh, a very uh, huge part of the winemaking um, uh, with the, the upper end Pinot Noirs. And, and we do, you know, single vineyards, so site specific. So we Eola Amity Hills with Zenith Vineyard and Bjornsson Vineyard, uh, Dundee Hills with. Uh, Anderson Family Vineyard. Um, we're always looking at wanting to do more single vineyards, but it's always a, a bit of a struggle in the marketplace because there's so many. Um, I, I would love to bottle every vineyard separately, but the, it's hard to sell every single vineyard to a distributor and so forth. So, um, but uh, uh, the, the showing a, a single place in a year is really what's the most intriguing to me. It's this one vineyard, one year, and it, it's different every year slightly. And that's what's cool. And you can talk about the why that is. And it's it, it's still a learning experience with, with the climate change we're seeing. It's it's trying to understand. Uh, it's, it's not hot or cool years anymore. It's like it's when you got the heat, how much you got, and what was the soil mo- uh, moisture like at that point. And, you know, what are all the little factors? And they're trying to really understand how uh, everything's being affected along the way. Um, yeah, Chardonnay. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just jumping around here. <laughs> For Chardonnay, we definitely have a very old world style, like all our wines. We're, uh, we're, we try to make things that are less about um, just opulence and more about a little bit of temperance and prettiness and elegance. Uh, we picked the Chardonnay's grapes on the earlier side. Uh, we do both single vineyard and a mix. For a couple years, Doug has been nice enough to sell me some Chardonnay at Brickhouse Vineyards, but uh, not anymore. <laughs> but um, but uh, we, we ferment in barrel, uh, all French oak. Uh, we age on lees for, for 18 months. Um, again, uh, we're, we're bringing... Uh, a bit of a higher end winemaking to uh, lower price points. Uh, that longer time on lees, you know, picking early for low alcohols and bright acids and the right uh, uh, fruit quality. Um, you just build palate texture and weight through that extended surly aging. It's really amazing how much the wine changes. How these wines that are coming in in the mid twelves just feel so much more voluminous than they are. Uh, well, then not than they are, but then the the alcohol level would suggest is a better way of putting that. Sorry. Um, and then um, and limited amount of new oak too. We're just using about twenty five percent at the most. Um, some wines are only about six percent. Uh, for the Lima Valley Cuvée, about six percent, and then the yeah, the single vineyard about twenty five percent. So keeping keeping the oak as a, a flavor but more from the 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 buoyancy and uh lift it gives the wine on the palate it's not so much the flavor i want it's the structure uh and definition it brings to the wine yeah and then the last thing we make more and more of is gamay noir uh i i uh, when i was studying wines from a uh, uh, just enjoyment factor and working in a restaurant and really getting intrigued in wine 
the best place to study, especially in the 90s, was uh, Beaujolais. I mean, where you could get just beautiful, you know, terroir-driven wine for 15, 20 bucks. And, and it's gone up a little bit, but you can still find great value for 20, 25 bucks. Wines that are show place uh, more than hand and... Uh, uh, we try to bring that to uh, uh, the Gamay in the Willamette Valley, where we're doing three different single vineyards right now, uh, two in the same AVA uh, in the Yola Amity Hills, Redford Weddell Farm and Bjornsson, and the other one up in the Shehala Mountains AVA, and they're all very different. I mean, Redford Weddell Farm and Bjornsson Vineyard, they're about maybe four miles apart, uh, but... He, just uh, couldn't be more different. Redford Weddell on the East Slope, very red cranberry pomegranate, um, sweet uh, floral spice. Uh, whereas uh, Bjornsson Vineyard, higher elevation, faces southwest. Just it's more like uh, baked. Uh, uh, gosh, I don't know. Some of it's like strawberries baked a little bit. They're just very strong and dark and firm. Uh, the tannic structure is huge. The acidity is always very high. Those wines sometimes are very... Actually, the 2018, I didn't bottle in the summer because I couldn't get it to finish mallow, malactic, because the pH was so low. <laughs> it just didn't want to finish. And I I think it's done now. i got to bottle it in the next month. But, um, yeah. 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 And then up in the Shehala Mountain, the, the Twelve Oaks Estate is very blue-fruited, very, very supple, very blue, very round and just more generous and easy um all those all three sites are volcanic soil sites but uh the the thickness of the soil and the the composition and the um of the soil as well as just the the the, the climactic the the weather factors uh just all bring different different styles to uh to these three vineyards which is fun I, you know i love the description there because yeah, I think in it, it almost feels like yeah, this is it being the last interview, uh, you know, of the of the tour that I, that I'm on, and uh, you know, the journey that the listener's been on. You know, you 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 you've taken us around yeah, lots of different sites there. This this kind of, you know, like this yeah, eighty five percent is this kind of main production, fifteen percent is this kind of potpourri almost of all these different sites, and uh, but but yeah, kind of underpinned by. On one side, the yeah, that kind of the value and and the accessibility, but then yeah, getting into kind of yeah, some of the some of the more serious uh, single site expressions and uh, yeah, I just think it's a it's just a, it, it, that in of itself is 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 for me is a, is an important story because it's like yeah, you're you're not I don't think as a winemaker you're not sort of compromised by making at different levels like that and and you know potentially making for a different type of consumer you know the person that's that's getting the single vineyards may not be the person that gets the commuter cuvee or they may be they may have the commuter cuvee midweek and they have the other and special occasions and you know they who knows you know the i guess on some level you make these wines you get the fruit you do the best you can and you put it out there into the world you know and once it leaves the cellar it's it's out there and it's in people's hands so um uh, yeah, I, I, I really, I uh, just want to sort of, I guess, really close off, you know, just in, in terms of, you know, giving you, uh, really, as I've given everybody else uh, in the series, kind of the, you know, the voice, the floor, um, the opportunity, just to, yeah, to kind of project forward, really, you know, and, and you know, I think we've got a real strong sense of your base now and, and what that kind of looks like now and, and really yeah just just ask you to kind of yeah look into your crystal ball and and look ahead i guess yeah for you for the region for the grape varieties you know whatever sort of elements of that kind of you know feel closest and f most front of mind in jan 2020 just kind of yeah be potentially be a bit speculative about that for the region uh, i think it it's going to see a lot more involvement here from Californians and from Frenchmen, uh, French people, <laughs> um, because uh, one in California, we for for those folks we have water <laughs> and we have uh, we have land that's really well priced and we have. Um, 
uh, more heat than we did 20 years ago, so we can hit their balance sheets in a better place as far as the amount of uh, money they can make off an, an, an area of land or so forth from a, a, a really a, a businessy look uh, standpoint. Um, but but um, the brand Oregon is getting more known slowly around the world. Um, and uh, uh, I see it only growing in that regard. And, and, you know, with the Burgundians, there's just a lot of people coming here because there's only so much land in Burgundy. And what little bit there is uh, is very expensive. Uh, it's hard to produce value there now. And if you want to grow your business, you essentially have to leave uh, Burgundy. And so that's why you're seeing more and more investment uh, in the U.S. Uh, from from the vineyards there. Yeah, the Burgundians will bring more, uh, some expertise, but also different experience uh, to to Oregon. Um, they'll have name and cachet with people that people in Oregon strive to get name with because we don't, you know, we're, what, a 55-year-old industry. And really, it's only been in the last 30 that we've been an industry of, some repute. I mean, really, when Domain Druin came here, I believe it was 88, um, that's when we really started getting on the world map, but that was still a long build from there up to the point where we were well regarded around this country, let alone the world. Um, so uh, I see that growing the perception of Oregon wines in a lot of people's minds around the world uh, and the industry growing. But in the short term, we have, um, you know, a lot of great uh, wineries producing uh, wonderful wines. And uh, it's it's still um, educating people as to where Oregon is and what it produces and what Pinot Noir is. And, you know, Oregon Pinot Noir is so different from what you see in Southern California or even uh, Northern California. Um, so many people have an experience of Pinot Noir being that Californian style first and were a little bit different. So it's, it's, it's still an educational process, um, and uh, it, it, it's only growing. For me, for Groshaw sellers, um, it's, boy, uh, for me, the, 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 the thing I would like to have is a vineyard. It feels like I'm missing a leg on my chair uh, by not having one because for a long time I, I didn't want to. I, I, it's too much work. It's not. Um, uh, it's not my my knowledge base. Not my forte. But um, over time, uh, I realized just how much you leave behind to somebody else. Um, I do get a level of control with farming with our contracts, but I don't have ultimate control, and I can't make quick changes with them. It's it's a it's it's steering the ship, you know. Analogy. It, it takes a while longer, and it's uh, it's a financial conversation every time it is, and so forth. But um, if it were my own, I could really get to know everything block every plant. Well, every block anyway, not plant, but t to know the nuances of the vineyard, the changes in soil, the little bit difference in airflow, um, sun aspects, shading trees, all these little things that can really uh, affect uh, the ripeness or the style of wine that comes off a, a certain area. When I when I worked for Brickhouse, I remember um, Doug was uh, it was one harvest. I I don't know. I guess two thousand one. Uh, or something, but um, where we were picking down the middle of a block, uh, like he put a big piece of flagging tape down the middle of the rows that we we're picking. It's like we're picking from here to here. We're not going over here, and and it was at the time I was like, why? And then it's like thinking about oh, the aspect's a little different, the soil's a little different, and he just really wanted to capture that aspect on that day, not like the whole section. And uh, but it took me a while to realize that, and 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 now I want that level control, that minutia, uh, more. But uh, it's expensive. <laughs> but it's also growing the commuter cuvee. In addition to that, I mean, they're growing, growing the value, trying to bring more people. Uh, 
you know, wines uh, of great value and, again, punching above weight so forth. Um, you know, just trying to bring great value to people and that show place that the show Willamette Valley. Um, but, yeah, the vineyard's more important. <laughs> Thank you so much, John, for sharing your time and your humor with us. And editing this now in March 2020, it was absolute pleasure to listen back to Happier Times. Do, of course, check out below for John's website. As I mentioned, this is the 20th and final installment of the Willamette Valley Winemaker Special. John's episode number 399 will, of course, take its place alongside all the other episodes in the playlist, which you can find at interpretingwine.com slash WVWA. Given the recent turn of events and the challenges facing hospitality industry all over the world, I would encourage anybody linked to winemaking in the Willamette Valley to share either this playlist or individual episode numbers far and wide to ensure that the wonderful people and winemakers of the region are kept front of mind at this difficult time. At the time of recording, I know that many of the guests were organizing home delivery, curbside pickup and takeaway options. And wherever possible, do please try to support local businesses, because I think we all need good people and good wine at times like this. Signing off the series, I do just want to say another huge thank you to everybody at the Willamette Valley Winery Association, who took a punt on bringing me over from London to interview your winemakers. I really hope that the 20 episodes help everybody get through this challenging time, and that I'm able to visit again, revisit with old friends, and make new ones in the near future. More so than ever, do please let me know if there's anything that I can do for you. You can find me on social media, where I'm at Interpreting Wine on Instagram and Facebook, at Wine Podcast on Twitter, or email hello at interpretingwine.com. See you next time. <laughs>